the topic is something like uh, what's the Philippine future? Yeah, the Philippine future. And uh, I don't know whether, whether what is meant is long-run future or the short-run future. Uh, it's both, right? Uh, I was, remem I, I was uh, reminded that uh, somebody said, I think it was John Maynard Keynes, in the long run, we're all dead. So how, why would we care? But I think uh, it, uh, we're talking about uh, two types of future. The immediate, uh, the immediate future, which to me is something like the next 10 years, and possibly the one which probably matters more because uh, economic history is about the long run, you know, when the long run begins to live in terms of the interpretation of uh, historians. And so that might be the time, at least relevant to our lives, it may be the time when all the young people here are senior citizens and most of us are gone, okay? Uh, so my, my, oh, including you. <laughs> uh, my, my own thinking is that uh, the short run has a lot of prospects, but there are many things wrong which we have to correct. And I think those corrections require enormous amount of leadership. Now, the, the question posed by Jeff uh, uh, in giving us these numbers uh, tell us that we had once uh, been part of a very dynamic growth. And in fact, looking at, the, at our recent 150 years of history, 100, 100 years plus history, uh, the first uh, part of it were really great. Why? Because we, when we became a colony of the U.S., we just became part of a larger economy. We were part of a very big uh, economy that uh, was growing in dynamic form. Uh, all the benefits and all the, all the growth that was going to America was benefiting us. And then, of course, uh, in the latter part, when America was meeting its own problems, we also fell by the wayside. In fact, uh, we suffered a little more when America suffered a little. Uh, why? Because we were not really an integral part of the American mainland. And uh, whenever we were rising, we were rising with the big rise of American prosperity, and you see that in, that, in those statistics. When there was depression, we were hit much more because we got, we got quotas for our exports. We got uh, specific, uh, uh, we, we were limited in a few of the major exports that we had. But even those exports led to enormous amount of progress for the country. I, I talk about sugar being a major element in the growth of the Philippine economy in the, in the pre-war in the colonial times, I mean American colonial times, coconut oil. Uh, these, are, these are prominent industries, but they, of course, uh, led, because they were very prominent, they led uh, the politics of the nation, basically. Now, uh, uh, when we were colonists, uh, our new leaders, our, our uh, political leaders were learning a lot about what Americans were doing, and I think they were learning from the American imperialism uh, uh, tactics. So one, one might say, because when we were part of the American economy, we were also, I mean, Americans were also trying to maximize the benefits to American citizens. So they were excluding, I mean, when, when issues were tied up with Americans in relation to other foreigners, they were always favoring Americans. That kind of lesson was learned a lot by the local politicians. And when in 19, uh, and uh, even though we did not learn very much from the progress, uh, from the, I mean, even though we stumbled in part of the, uh, during the years of the depression, when our industry sort of went down together with a lot of American industries, the very same industries that uh, were uh, competitors of Philippine products became our champion for independence. So, uh, I mean, the sugar block in America, I mean, the sugar interest in America were, were the ones who really made the big vote for Philippine independence. 
the tidings Macduffy law or the previous one. So these things uh, should be remembered as historical features of our past. What did those things uh, lead to? It made our politicians devise tactics so that they could learn to exclude foreigners from getting to the heart of Philippine progress. This was, I think, the original scene of Philippine development. When our, when our uh, political leaders began to introduce in the Constitution of 1935, all the restrictive provisions on land, on public utilities, on the exploitation of natural resources, uh, limiting it only mainly to Filipino citizens and using 60-40 uh, as the kind of dividing line for equity control in the case of corporations and in the case of individual uh, citizens they were excluded, basically, from uh, engaging. Uh, whether these things would have been important after independence or not uh, was a matter of political play. In, uh, at the end of the year, uh, at the end of uh, the American colonial period, I think we were mainly placed to be among the most suited to rise up and become one of the, one of the uh, leading development countries, developing countries in the East Asia region, you know, barring Japan. Japan was really far above. China was doubtful. It was, you know, tipped, uh, it was a big case of if, we, uh, with, with the civil disturbances going there, and so on and so forth. But this is making history too long. I mean, uh, I, I'm talking already too long, but the point, the point I'm making really is that these things that we have today are still in the Constitution. And when we look back into all the things that we have done uh, in the efforts of the government to try to correct some of the ills or some of the, some of the problems of uh, Philippine uh, development policy, everything went to understanding how we can attract foreign capital. So the statistics on the, on the attraction of foreign capital is, uh, is, uh, just reflects, I think, these provisions of the Constitution. Why did we not change those provisions? It's very hard to say. You know, when, Mark, when I was working in the government, Marcos was presiding over the whole country's evolution. But would you make, uh, would, would the president of the country, uh, you know, he was presiding the closure of the Laurel Langley Treaty. And of course, he saw a different light. He saw a different light. Perhaps there was something different there. But uh, changes in regulations were being, uh, were being, uh, I mean, changes in policies were being introduced. And most of us were optimistic that we could make things turn around. I suspect that uh, it was very difficult because every time, every time we were making changes in policies, we had big lawyers everywhere trying to tell us that some of these issues are constitutional. So when we changed policies about improving the exploitation of resources, uh, to uh, natural resources, in including uh, the participation of 100% foreign corporations, because a lot of this, a lot of this exploitation uh, uh, activities would have required enormous amount of capital in mining, you know, and exploration, uh, mineral oil, energy, and so on. You needed participation of the big players, not the players who had little money, and then they look for other partners later on. Uh, so uh, the device was to use a, a contractual, I mean, a, a kind of device that avoided the general provisions but still followed the heart of the provisions because they, they really required that, uh, I mean, uh, in, in terms of the discussion of who owned the resources, it's really the Philippine government. But then uh, through a trick of the interpretation, it was possible to allow and uh, allow foreign participation. In fact, the recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which was rendered only in the year two, 
2005. You can imagine, only in the year 2005, when in fact the original law was passed in the, I mean, it was being proposed in the 1970s and was adopted as a presidential decree that allowed it. Uh, it was subjected to enormous changes and review and so on, and we had this problem. So uh, Jeff was asking, when was the turn of events in this uh, 